In this video, I will cover why it is so hard for some kids to master the analog clock face. The analog clock face is the one with the hands. I will cover the most important questions that you may miss when teaching someone to tell time on an analog clock face, the one with hands. Certainly, if your child is struggling with learning to tell time. If you like this video, I'd like to remind you to subscribe to the channel and hit a like on the video. Maybe also hit the bell icon if you want to be reminded of new video that I launch. You may also want to comment below if your experience is similar or if I miss out anything that you think is important in how to teach a child to tell the time. Also, please share the video with anyone you think might benefit from watching it. Here's a link to an online clock that I use in my work with dyslexics and dyscalculics, especially when I work through Zoom. Now, there are seven areas that people tend to miss when they are teaching a child to tell the time. Number one, where are the hours and where are the minutes on the clock face? Number two, why does the small hand tell the bigger chunks of time and the big hand tell the smaller chunks of time? Number three, where do we start counting from and why? Number four, why can I not see the zero on the clock face? Where is it? Number five, what's the difference between two, two, and two? Number six, what's the difference between past, past, and past? Number seven, two what, and past what? Let's start with question number one. Where are the hours, and where are the minutes on a clock face? The numerals on a clock face represent the hours and the tiny lines around the outer edge represent the minutes. And some clock faces don't even have lines indicating the minutes at all. We sometimes have to imagine them. Number two, why does the small hand tell the bigger chunks of time and the big hand tell the smaller chunks of time? The answer is simply that the minutes are further away from the center and smaller than the hours. And therefore the minute hand needs to be longer in order to show the exact minute. To discover this, it's important to have a clock face where the minutes are indicated with lines around the perimeter of the clock face, and the minute hand reaches the minute lines, or at least reaches very close to them. The numerals representing the hours are normally positioned much closer to the center of the clock face, and therefore we do not need a very long hand to indicate the current hour. Number three, where do we start counting from, and why? First, make sure your learner has full clarity about the meaning of the word from. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as the point in space at which a journey, motion or action starts. Someone decided long ago that on a clock face we always start counting at the top. We do not count the minutes from where the small hand is. So when the time is five minutes past one, the minute hand does not point at a point five minutes past the numeral one on the clock face. It does not point at the numeral two on the clock face. At five past one, the minute hand points to a place five minutes from the top of the clock face. And that point happens to be where the numeral one is on the clock face. And pretty much where the hour hand is at that point in time, at five past one. It's also important to know that the starting point in counting is not the numeral one, but zero. So the top is not one, it is zero. And this leads us to the next question, which is number four. Why can I not see the zero on the clock face? Where is it? We cannot see zero because it's hidden behind the numeral 12. Because 12 o'clock completes the circle on the clock face, that location functions as a reset point for counting. Therefore, the numeral 12 also represents zero o'clock when the hour hand points to the top, even though the numeral zero is not written on the clock face. More importantly, this point on the clock face is a reset point for both the hours and the minutes. So it represents both 12 hours and zero hours, and it also represents both 60 minutes and zero minutes. So, even though the minutes are generally not written in numerals on the clock face, we start counting the minutes from the top. And even though the minutes are indicated by small lines around the edge of the clock face, the lines are actually not the minutes. The minutes are in fact the spaces between the lines. 
So when we count minutes, we are actually counting the spaces between the minute lines because it takes exactly one minute for the minute hand to travel from one minute line to the next. At this point, we might be ready to spend some time counting the minutes forward from the top. Start counting the spaces between the minute lines and this might well result in the child recognizing the fact that there are five minutes between the larger lines, even though the larger lines confusingly also mark each hour. If the child already knows the five times table, they can start counting the minutes in groups of five, but make sure that they're only counting clockwise from the top and avoid using the word past at this point. We are simply counting how many minutes we are from the starting point at the top. It's okay to go beyond the halfway, 30 minutes, as long as you stick to the language of counting the minutes clockwise from the top. We can even go all the way to 60 minutes and explain that we are now back at the starting point, and that means we start counting the minutes of the next hour, starting back at zero minutes. Once we have cleared up any confusion about the design of the clock face, we need to move on to the words we use when describing time. And that leads us on to question number five. What is the difference between two, two, and two? All of these words tend to confuse children, and especially dyslexics. This is partly because they all make the same sound, but they all have different meaning and different spelling. More importantly, the meaning of two and two is not easy to picture. To fully clear up the confusion between these three words requires the Davis symbol mastery for words, and that's a subject for another video which I will link to in the description below once I've made that video. For now, we mainly need to simply and effectively clear up confusion about the word to when used for telling time. But how can you do that? It's always most effective if you can turn your teaching into a fun game. I use a simple fun way to explain the meaning of the word to, based on the dictionary definitions from the Webster's Children's Dictionary, where the definition says, in the direction of. I have the learner stand or sit about four to five feet away from me and prepare them for catching a soft small ball or a beanbag. Then I say, I am tossing this ball to you. And then I toss the ball carefully to the child so they can catch it. I then explain that one of the dictionary definitions for two says in the direction of. We check if that's true. Did I toss the ball in the direction of you? If there is any confusion left around that, I may toss the ball in a different direction and ask, am I now tossing the ball to you? Once they say no, ask them, does that mean I was not tossing the ball in the direction of you? When your learner has fully understood the meaning of the word to, you can move immediately on to mastering the word past. And that leads us to question number six. What's the difference between past, past, and past? Think of something in the past. If I ask you to think of something in the past, you are likely to think of something that has already happened. The past is before now. But the word past can also have a very different meaning. As well as meaning earlier, it can also mean later. When I say it is past your bedtime, it doesn't refer to something that happened in the past. It means that you have reached your bedtime and moved further forward in time. In other words, it means that it is now later than your bedtime. This is the meaning of past, which we use on a clock face. In this case, past means the opposite of in the past. Five minutes past means five minutes later. So how can we clear up this very confusing idea? We can use exactly the same physical setup as when we cleared up the confusion about the word to. With a cheeky smile, you ask the learner if he is ready to catch the ball again. Once they've agreed, you throw the ball past them, fast enough so they will not be able to catch it. This allows you to explain the difference between the word to and past. You can ask, did I throw the ball to you? They may say yes, and then you can explain what was different this time around. I threw the ball past you this time, didn't I? Keep asking leading questions about what happened until your learner explains to you that the ball went past them. Then you can look up the definition in the dictionary, which will say something like to a place and further. It might be useful and interesting to explore exactly at what point that ball stopped moving to them and reached the point of moving past them. Once these two concepts have been mastered, you can bring your learner's attention to the minute hand on the clock face. We can now look at whether the minute hand is moving in the direction of, to, a place on the clock face, or if it has moved to a place on the clock face 
and further past a place. And that brings us to the next area of potential confusion. To what and past what. To understand how we read the minute hand, the child first needs to understand where we count from. But if you follow the previous guidance, that should now be clear, as long as your learner understands that the meaning of the word from. Of course, your learner now knows that the starting point is at the top of the clock face. Now your learner may be ready to have a look at the movement of the hour hand as well. The minute hand tells us how many minutes we have gone past an hour, and the hour hand tells us which hour we have just moved past. Your learners now should be able to tell you not only that it's 10 past, but also 10 past what? But once the minute hand has gone past the halfway mark around the clock face, it starts moving back towards the top, back to our starting point. This is when we need to use the word to, meaning in the direction of. If your learner can now show you on a clock face what 40 minutes past two looks like, then you can ask him to figure out and tell you how many minutes until the minute hand is back to the starting point at the top. You might want to tell him that it's still easiest to start counting from the top, only now we are counting in the other direction, counterclockwise. He can count one minute at a time, or in groups of five if they know the five times table. Help him explore this until he realizes that 40 minutes past two is the same as 20 minutes to three, because the minute hand is now moving to the end of the circle, the top. You can also point out that now the hour hand is moving in the direction of another hour. It's moving to three o'clock. The only thing left to explain is the fact that when counting the minutes on a clock face, it's always easiest to count the shortest distance from the top. So it's much easier and quicker to count 10 minutes counterclockwise than counting 50 minutes clockwise. This is the reason why 50 minutes past two is generally called 10 minutes to three, or just 10 to three. So what do you think? Did I miss something out? Is there something that you disagree with? If so, comment below. Thank you for watching and please share the video with anyone you think might benefit from it.